So, uh, hi all, welcome to the next uh, session of the GOAT seminar. Today we have Rostislav Farčík from Soček Technik University in Prague. Uh, we'll talk about classical planning and cost adversarial planning games. Okay, so thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> Uh, actually, I didn't didn't uh, know what uh, should I expect from the audience, so I only know that, knew that that, that uh, Andre asked me that I should say something about uh, about planning, uh, which I told him that I'm just do, doing a bit. <laughs> uh, okay, so <clears throat> I decided to let's say deliver kind of a non-technical talk. Uh, in the first part of my talk, I will very briefly. Uh, introduce uh, planning, namely classical planning, what, what the community of people in planning are actually doing, uh, what are their goals and so on. And, and the rest of the talk will be rather focused on game theory, but uh, still it will be somehow related to, to, to planning. Uh, actually, uh, I would like to present uh, our, uh, our paper with my colleagues, uh, Pavel Ricky, Sukash Hrpa, Stefan Elkamp and Alvaro Torauma. Uh, the, the paper itself uh, is, uh, let's say, from a mathematical point of view, is, 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 is not deep. Uh, the, the, the main motivation was rather to, to show that, that uh, planning formalism can be used to, to model, uh, let's say, interesting class of, of, of games. Uh, uh, yeah, and I, I will just discuss that and uh, its advantages and disadvantages and stuff like that. <laughs> okay, so let me start with the classical planning. So, Perhaps uh, if I would somehow describe the community of, of people working in classical playing, I would say that, that uh, it's quite similar to, let's say, people, to a group of people who, who are trying to develop some efficient, uh, let's say, SAT solvers or uh, integer programming solvers, right? So they have some kind of uh, formalized problem, formalized input, and uh, they, are, they, are, they are striving to to let's say uh, develop uh, efficient solvers for their problem, right? <clears throat> of course, they are let's say up to now they are not so successful as let's say people from SAT solvers or let's say integer programming solvers, but still uh, they uh, they are trying to to improve. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, the problem in, in planning is is uh, actually pretty simple. Uh, we are given some diagraph whose uh, arcs are labeled by first just by some names which are called actions and uh, then they are labeled by some numbers which are, cost, uh, which are the costs of, of those actions and uh, then we are given some let's say uh, initial initial state this is called initial state in the graph it's just a vertex and we are just given some set of uh, goal vertices of, of states and uh, our uh, let's say <clears throat> aim is to find some paths going from the initial state to, to some to any of the goal states. Uh, so the input of the problem is just uh, given like as follows. You are given some uh, initial state, you are given some set of goal states, and uh, then you have those edges which actually define some deterministic transi transition function. And uh, your task is to find uh, a plan, which is just a pass leading from the initial state to, to a goal state. And uh, usually we are also striving to find the optimal plan, which is just a shortest path. Mm -hmm. And it's just sequence of actions, actually. Uh, so perhaps uh, you can also understand this as a, just a standard deterministic finite automaton, right? Where we have states, we have uh, deterministic transitions, we have some final states, which are the goal states, and we have some initial states, which is just uh, the, the zero. <clears throat> and uh, the problem with this, the computational, let's say, challenge is that uh, you are not given, you are not given uh, the, the, whole, uh, the whole automaton transition system, but uh, you have only a succinct representation of that. Right. which means that you really have a, only the initial state, uh, some specification of the goal states, and let's say somehow specify the, the transition trans transition fu function. Right. So in order to, let's say, make uh, everything kind of uniform that, that people can, let's say, compare their solutions uh, between each other, uh, planning community developed kind of standardized language called EDDL, 
uh, where you can actually specify your input and then all all the people let's say working in that community uses that 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 language almost all of them of course and and uh, uh, I mean, their solutions are in this sense kind of domain independent because uh, you have just uh, really a unified input. So this is similar like to, to let's say, set solvers, right? Where the input is just just a boolean formula and you are looking for a satisfying evaluation. Uh, this, is, this is similar. You are giving some input. Uh, I will just describe it in a moment, uh, how it looks like, and you should just find the, the plan. So the PDL actually, the input is, uh, given in two parts. The first one describes the domain of, 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 your, of your planning uh, situation. Uh, and actually, everything is based on first order logic. So the domain is described by means of first order relational language. So you have just uh, some set of predicates and the rarities and stuff like that. Uh, and then the transitions are actually given by uh, action schemata. Uh, I will just describe them in a moment. And the second part, the, the actual task, the planning task is given just by the inertial state, which is just some first order relational structure in that language, which is specified in the domain. And then you have some conditions specifying the goal states, which is usually some conjunctions of some atomic formula saying what should be valid in the goal, right? <clears throat> so the states uh, of the graph, which I, or the graph, which I forgot at, at the previous slide, are actually the relational structures, right? So we have relational structures. Uh, at the beginning, we are, we are just given the initial uh, first order structure, and the transitions uh, are prescribed by action schemata, which are just the pairs uh, of precondition and, and some effect. So <clears throat> they have some parameters. So if you want to find out which, uh, let's say, actions you can apply in some in some state, you have to ask, uh, well, for which axis the precondition holds. In, in my uh, in my state current state and uh, for those you can say well if I have some particular uh, instances of those axes such that the precondition is valid then uh, for those axes I can just apply some effect on my state and produce a new one right and really the effect has just two parts the positive and negative one the positive just tells me which atomic formulas should be valid in, in the current, in the next state and the negative, which should stop be valid, right? So this is just kind of what should be added and what should be removed. <laughs> so that's uh, <clears throat> that's basically the, the, the input. So uh, <clears throat> of course, this is pretty. The precondition usually is, is modeled like a conjunction of some of some atomic formulas. Mm -hmm. So it's like a conjunctive query, let's say. So you are looking for those uh, tuples which satisfy that query. And for those, you can just uh, see what kind of effects you can apply to your, to your state. So I mean, that this, this language is, is relatively uh, expressive. That's why the, uh, the, the corresponding uh, decidability problem uh, about, about uh, I mean, that if you ask if, if there is a plan actually in your, in your planning task, then uh, this problem is uh, in the full generality complete in exponential space. Uh, which is of course terrible, <laughs> and people are of course studying different kinds of fragments. Uh, but anyway, it's like that. It's, well, it's like if it's it's a solvers, right? Uh, I, I remember that Moshe Mardis once told me that that uh, uh, that, that when Ku proved that uh, such is NP complete, the, many people just left the, the area and they, they, they didn't uh, they didn't develop any any kind of solvers anymore. But some people uh, remained, and uh, apparently it was uh, say fruitful to, 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 to strive and then let's say try to build uh, some solvers with, which can let's say solve at least a reasonable size a reasonable size uh, sized uh, instances, right? <clears throat> okay, so so uh, so people are usually uh, choosing several from several possible approaches how to how to how to let's say solve the problem one of them is, is let's say this one at the beginning uh, you do some reachability analysis analysis because uh, of course every, everything is built up uh, on top of the first order language so and you have the action schemata you, you may ask uh, which actually the, the ground instances of, of your of your formulas appearing in those schemata 
uh, might appear in the reachable state space. So uh, in order to, let's say, improve the, uh, the efficiency and the, 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 the reachability analysis, analysis is done. <clears throat> so we can, let's say, get rid of some uh, apparently non-reachable uh, formulas in, 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 your, uh, in, in your planning task. Uh, next, uh, uh, you can just uh, translate your first order representation to a propositional one using just standard group grounding uh, known from uh, say mathematical logic. And, and finally, you can just use some search algorithm to, to, to find your plan. And that, that algorithm is navigated by some heuristic. So most of the work done in planning is actually uh, the people are inventing different kinds of heuristics and then they compare uh, their results with, with, with other approaches. Uh, so that, that's one particular, let's say, approach. There are different ones. Uh, for example, you can try to, after the grounding, you can try to encode the problem into, into a SAT, uh, SAT instance, or people are also using, uh, let's say, techniques from uh, modal checking. Uh, where they represent their states by some binary decision diagrams and stuff like that. <clears throat> but uh, roughly speaking, this is, let's say, uh, what people are doing. And finally, uh, of course, everything is tested uh, against some set of benchmark uh, data sets. And uh, if you are good enough, then you can, uh, let's say, compete with others uh, in, in the international planning competition, which is organized, let's say, every couple of years. Uh, and uh, if you are successful, then you are winner. <laughs> that's, that's, that, that's the goal, right? So uh, uh, this is, let's say, roughly what, uh, what's my understanding of planning community. Uh, it's just uh, about, let's say, inventing different kinds of, uh, let's say, heuristic approaches, how to, how to solve uh, this uh, apparently difficult problem. <clears throat> OK, so. That's, that's planning. Uh, the next part, uh, I would like to uh, present uh, our results <clears throat> on, uh, let's say, some combination of planning and, and, and game theory. Uh, <clears throat> uh, as I said, uh, we, we haven't done anything uh, particularly deep uh, from a mathematical point of view in the paper. Uh, but the, the main motivation was uh, rather to show that, that uh, one can model, let's say, uh, a reasonable or interesting class of uh, game theoretical problems uh, using, uh, let's say, this standardized language and tools from planning. Uh, that's why we introduced these cost adversarial planning games. Uh, and uh, the, the second motivation was that uh, inside this, this class of games uh, are actually so-called security games, which uh, are, let's say, inspired by practical applications uh, and studied mainly in, in game theory community. Uh, and uh, let's say I, I, I will discuss uh, if we model it by our approach of what, what kind of advantages that has and what are the limitations, let's say, of our approach and what other people are doing, let's say, in game theory uh, when they are solving these kinds of problems. <clears throat> okay, so let me first uh, recall several definitions from game theory. Uh, so I, I don't know uh, how much you know about that, uh, but let me let me start with uh, let's say class X, which is just uh, uh, definition of normal form games for two players. So uh, likely everyone knows a uh, rock paper scissors game. So this is this is its uh, definition as a two player normal form game. So it's given by a matrix where uh, in each entry of the matrix. You have two numbers, and those are the utilities for the first player and, and the second player, or for the row player and column player. Uh, so, for example, if, if uh, the, the row player plays rack and, and the, the column player plays scissors, then you see the, 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 the utilities uh, uh, for the game. So the, the utility for the row player is one, and the utility for the column player is minus one. All right. So, uh, formally speaking, uh, Two-player normal form game is just a four tackle where I have two sets for pure strategies. They are called pure strategies, uh, X and Y for the pro and cool player. And then I have two utility functions describing the utilities for every possible combinations of uh, both for, for, for strategies of the first and the second player. Right. So 
uh, among those, uh, let's say, interesting class are uh, games which are called zero sum. Those are such that uh, if you just sum those utility functions, you have zero or in general constant. And uh, for my talk, it will be also important to consider almost zero sum games where the sum need not be zero, but actually depends only on the uh, on the choice of the of the first player. Right. So uh, I will discuss the, their properties later on. <clears throat> so uh, I, uh, likely everyone knows that that let's say the optimal strategy for the rough paper scissors is just uh, <clears throat> to randomize uniformly over the pure strategies, right? So it doesn't make sense to play all the time just rack <laughs> because uh, that could be easily exploit exploited by the, the, the opponent. So you can see that that uh, we are going to not only speak about just the pure strategies, but uh, we, will, we will have to consider the randomized strategies, uh, which are just uh, probability distributions over the set of pure strategies. Right? So <clears throat> something which is called mixed strategy is just a probability distribution over the pure strategies. <clears throat> That's, for example, like this uniform distribution for the rough paper scissors. And uh, if, because uh, the, let's say, standard uh, say concept of the solution of such games is uh, an equilibrium. For that, I need to say what's the best, best response. So <clears throat> if you have some uh, strategy Q, let's say, and the best response P prime uh, is uh, just a strategy for the first player if it maximizes its its utility, right? his or her utility. <clears throat> right, and the Nash, Nash equilibrium is, is, uh, is defined by means of best responses. So if you have a pair of two strategies, P star, Q star, and it's called Nash equilibrium, if uh, those strategies are mutually best responses with, the, uh, with respect to each other, right? So none of the players, if, if you are, let's say, in, in, in that equilibrial point, none of the players, uh, uh, I mean, it doesn't make sense for her or him to, to change uh, her or his decision. Right, and to move from the equilibrium strategy. So <clears throat> this is, uh, let's say, uh, standard uh, one of the <laughs> one of the uh, notions of solution of a game. Uh, for zero sum games, it, it works quite nice because uh, actually there might be several uh, Nash equilibria in, in a given ga game, and in zero sum games, all the equilibria has the same value in, in the sense that it doesn't matter basically which uh, equilibrium strategy you choose. It always uh, the outcome is always the same. But if, if, you, if, if, if your uh, game is not zero sum, then uh, strange things might happen. For example, maybe you know the prisoner's dilemma that uh, there might be several equilibria. And uh, if you don't know what the other is going to play, then uh, <clears throat> the, the outcome might be different. Right? So it's, it's, it's difficult to decide. Actually, if, even if you compute all the Nash equilibria, it's not clear which of them to use <laughs> from the perspective of one player. But anyway, for zero sum games, uh, the Dunash equilibrium works well and can be solved, uh, can be computed in polynomial time by just a linear program. So it's just polynomial time in, in the size of the matrix, right? But uh, nevertheless, uh, quite often in practical applications, the, the games are pretty large. So it's, it's, not, it's not feasible to just construct the, the, the linear program and just solve it by I don't know, simplex method or whatever. So in that case, uh, people are usually using kind of iterative methods that they are, let's say, adding new and they're just looking on some sub game, right? Uh, and they're just adding new and new strategies and trying to, let's say, converge to, to, the, to the national equilibrium. So one of those methods is just a double oracle. It works as follows. So at the beginning, you have the, the matrix, but uh, you just, uh, Select randomly some two strategies, uh, and uh, this is like a game which is specified by matrix one by one, uh, and this is just the initial initial step. And then you can just start to add best responses for both players, right? So uh, in this uh, situation, I just first compute the best response uh, for the first player uh, with respect to Q zero, and also I will compute the best response. Uh, Q1 with respect to P0 for the 
for the second player. This gives me sub game specified by the matrix two times two. I can solve it just uh, using the linear program. I have an Nash equilibrium. And then again, I can just continue. With respect to those equilibrium strategies of, of the sub game, I can find the best, uh, best response for the first player and for the second player. I expand my, uh, my matrix by that. And uh, I have three times three sub game. I, again, I'm just adding those best responses uh, in this iterative process. And it's guaranteed that uh, finally you will, you will converge to a national equilibrium. Mm. Uh, so usually, if you are adding uh, any of those best responses, you are getting some upper and lower bound on, 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 the, on the value of the national equilibrium. Uh, of, uh, of national equilibrium. And uh, <clears throat> So it, it basically allows you to stop whenever these two bounds are close to each other. Uh, of course, uh, this, uh, I mean, it, what's, what's interesting on this is that, of course, the, the algorithm uh, might go through all possible strategies, right? So it's, it's not uh, that it should be uh, uh, quick in some sense. For example, uh, paper, scissors, you need in, in the equilibrium, you need all the strategies. Uh, on the other hand, it's known that uh, there exists a small epsilon equilibrium. If you want to just approx uh, approximate the equilibrium, it's known that there is uh, equilibrium, which is uh, whose size is logarithmic in, in the number of, uh, let's say, rows and columns of your, of your matrix. But uh, it's also possible to show that double oracle <laughs> doesn't find it quickly, right? Even though it's, it's there. So it's, it's not so difficult to construct an example where uh, where uh, the double oracle basically just iterates through all the 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 the, the, the few strategies before it, it finds the, the equilibrium uh, equilibrium strategies. <clears throat> so, and I, I think that it's not known whether there is uh, some reasonable iterative method which would uh, guarantee that, that 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 you can find the epsilon equilibrium in logarithmic number of steps. Let's say. So that, that's an interesting problem to to work on. <clears throat> Uh, but anyway, in, in, in practice, this, this usually uh, converges quite uh, quickly. <clears throat> okay, so that's one of the possibilities. The, 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 uh, 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 another uh, solution uh, notion for games uh, is uh, so-called Stuckelberg st st strategy. Uh, uh, and in that case, uh, we, are, we are understanding those, uh, uh, let's say, Normal form games uh, differently because uh, before I, when I was let's say discussing uh, paper, paper scissor, uh, this is like that everyone is just playing some some uh, some pure strategy, but uh, without knowing uh, what what the other, other is going to do. But uh, in the Stackelberg game, uh, the players are let's say different. The first player, called so-called leader, uh, commits to some strategy, uh, and that, that that's let's say announced. And the follower, the second player, uh, can observe that and uh, just replace by by her best response, right? So that's uh, that's uh, let's say different kind of setting. And uh, St Stuckelberg strategy for the first player is uh, let's say we are striving to find a mixed strategy P, which maximizes uh, the utility for the first player, provided that the second player plays her best response, right? So. <clears throat> That's uh, that's nice, but there is a caveat, a caveat uh, in the sense that the expression which I wrote down here is actually not well defined. The problem is, uh, and this is a similar problem with the double oracle, that uh, the best response is not uh, uniquely defined. Right? There might be several best responses, uh, so it's not clear which of them this should be. Right? <clears throat> uh, and uh, actually, so. Uh, th there are two uh, standard approaches how to define it. One is that uh, uh, that the opponent, let's say the follower, is, is playing the the best response, which is uh, best for the leader, which is kind of optimistic one, let's say. And in that case, uh, this uh, strategy P, Stackelberg st st strategy exists, and, and the resulting pair of strategies is called strong Stackelberg uh, equilibrium. Uh, the second approach is pessimistic one, uh, saying that well, uh, the the opponent follower is going to play uh, best response, which is worst for the follower uh, for, for the leader. Sorry, uh, and uh, this is called weak Stackelberg equilibrium. The problem with this is that uh, it need not exist. Uh, 
So people uh, in game theory, uh, in general, they, they focus on strong Stackelberg equilibrium uh, and uh, uh, uses that because it exists always. But uh, apparently it has some uh, problems uh, which, uh, which appeared, uh, uh, I mean, that, uh, they, they claim that it is always possible to, let's say, just deviate from the optimal strategy a bit to make the, 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 the follower somehow differentiate the, 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 the best responses. But uh, actually it's not possible. So people are now, let's say, are also inventing different kinds of notions of this, for example, inducible Stackelberg strategy and stuff like that. But anyway, uh, let me continue. So, so far as, as far as I know, uh, the, uh, the Stackelberg strategy, strategy is, is computed by solving several uh, linear programs for each pure, pure strategy of the follower. And then you, you choose the, 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 the best outcome. And of course, uh, there is no uh, iterative method which would be approximating the Stackelberg uh, strategy like, like a double record algorithm. Uh, anyway, what's, uh, let's say it's, it's related between those Stackelberg things and, and Nash equilibrium is that if you have a, uh, an almost zero sum game, then uh, the good thing is that you can associate uh, a zero sum game to that. So that uh, if you compute the if you compute the Nash equilibrium of the of the associated zero sum game, you have also the equilibrium Nash equilibrium of, of your almost zero sum game. And also, uh, if you just take the, the the equilibrium strategy of the first player uh, from the from the, the game G, then this is actually a start, start, Stackelberg strategy. Right, and, and there is no issue with these weak and strong. In this case, uh, everything just collapses. Right, so <clears throat> so be, because of this constraint that everything is almost zero sum, uh, the, the let's say the follower cannot uh, just uh, mix the things up much. <clears throat> so uh, even though uh, there might be several Nash equilibria of different values, for the first player, it doesn't matter which of them to play. Uh, it all only affects the the, the, the second player. Okay, so that's uh, that's let's say the, the what I need to, to say about the game theory. Of course, in general, uh, if you are playing, what this has uh, I mean, how this is related to planning. Actually, if you are just playing more complex games, they are usually consist of different kinds of moves where you are reacting re reacting to to opponent moves like like chess, uh, and. Uh, of course, uh, if you want to convert them to normal form games, then the pure strategies are actually policies, right? Which are just functions saying that if you are in some state of your game, what kind of actions you should apply. Uh, uh, so, and if you are playing a actual game, you can use the policy and it gives you a sequence of actions, which, uh, let's say, uh, takes you through the game. <clears throat> Uh, but there are some situations where actually you need to prepare the, the sequence of actions in advance and then you just execute it and uh, depending how it uh, end, ends up, uh, that, that's, that's let's say the outcome of, of the game. That might be pretty restrictive and it is actually. Uh, but anyway, I will just show you some examples uh, where this makes sense. Uh, and. Uh, this is actually the situation which we can, let's say, model easily with uh, planning, because uh, in that case, let's say the pure strategies are just plans, right? And uh, if we just uh, execute the plan, uh, the, the outcome of, of the game somehow depends what the, the opponent does. And let's say the, the, the simplest way uh, how to, let's say, model the interaction between the opponent and, and, and the planning player, let's say, is that uh, the opponent can. Uh, uh, can influence the actions of our, our actions, right? So cost of our actions. Mm -hmm. So uh, even though we just execute the plan, uh, depending what the, the other player did, uh, we finally pay some amount of, of whatever money for something like that. So maybe as, a, as an example of what this might be. So suppose that we have a simple scenario mm -hmm. where uh, you have some delivery service or whatever, and you are just uh, they are delivering packages in, in in some city, and you are you, there are some connections, right? And you have some distances between those, and uh, because uh, you want to be fast, then you are speeding uh, along the streets, 
uh, and you want to deliver everything as fast as possible. And of course, minimizing your, let's say, costs based on those distances. On the other hand, there is a police uh, and they are trying to prevent, let's say, those trucks to, 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 be, to be speeding. Uh, so, and, but they have some limited resources, right? So they can place some radars somewhere, but the question is where to place them actually. Uh, and of course, uh, everything has to be done kind of a randomized setting because if you are just placing the radar to, to the same position all the time, then of course the, <laughs> the guys from the delivery service just find out and they will just avoid it, right? So, so actually you can just, uh, this is exactly the, uh, the, this, this kind of situation Then I need to plan, let's say, passes for, for my tracks and, uh, and I need to somehow randomize them in order to avoid the radars. And the police uh, need to, let's say, place the the, the radars into different positions. So this is one of the examples. We have some some plan, let's say, uh, with some probability. So this this equilibrium strategy, let's say, has two two uh, two plans, which are uh, randomized somehow, and the police places uh, on some on some edges of of that graph uh, the radars again with different kinds of of uh, probabilities. So. <clears throat> So formally, uh, what we were discussing uh, in our paper was that uh, whenever you have some planning task and you have its uh, set of plans and you have some, let's say, base cost function, which gives you the base, uh, base cost of your actions, and you have uh, another extra set of cost function, which, uh, let's say, opponent can uh, choose in order to modify your base cost function, then you can define a kind of games where the first player, planning player, is playing the plans and uh, the opponent is playing just cost functions. And it's almost zero sum in the sense that the uh, utility of the, of the planning player is just the cost of the plan, negative of the, of the cost of the plan. And uh, then it's modified by the, by, by the choice of the opponent. And uh, the opponent is just uh, having uh, Based on the on, on, on the selected uh, cost function, is, is this utility given? <clears throat> so, if you have such such things, you can uh, compute the best responses uh, by means of any standard optimal planner. So it's possible to apply double oracle algorithm together with the optimal planner in order to solve uh, this these kind of games and to compute the, the Nash equilibrium. Right. So <clears throat> that's. Uh, let's say the, the formal framework and uh, the, the games, which I, uh, uh, I was speaking about at the beginning that uh, uh, people from game theory are trying to, let's say, model somehow. Uh, and uh, we are also trying to model it somehow using our framework and so-called security games. Uh, and uh, this is this kind of problem. You have some guarded area or area you would like to protect. And uh, you have some, let's say, base. And uh, within the area, there are some locations where uh, some attacker can, let's say, uh, can, do, can do something wrong, right? Something bad. Like a terrorist might uh, attack, uh, let's say, some, I don't know, place a bomb uh, to, to some building in, in an airport, or uh, let's say, a poacher can put some snare in, into some national park and stuff like that. <clears throat> and uh, uh, so the attacker is actually one of the players. The second player is the <coughs> defender. And uh, the defender has uh, limited resources. So uh, he cannot, let's say, just go through all the possible locations and just inspect all of them. But uh, he must, uh, let's say, decide which of them to visit and let's say what kind of sequence of actions to do in order to, let's say, protect the area right, with those, with, with those resources. So, so usually, uh, you are trying to invent some kind of probabilistic mixed strategy where you have different kinds of uh, patrolling, uh, let's say, sequences of actions, and uh, you are randomized between each of them, and you are just uh, visiting some some places and, and do something you know to, to protect the areas. Uh, this is usually in game theory modeled as Stackelberg game. Uh, so uh, the defender is, is is the leader. So it, it's assumed that, uh, let's say, the, the attacker can, uh, can uh, observe the behavior of, of, of the, the defender. And so he, he knows the, 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 the defender's strategy. And then, then 
the attacker can react somehow by by the best response. And you are trying to, let's say, prepare for that. Uh, the issue with the, the usual approach is that if you want to compute the Stuck Stuckerberg strategy, uh, then uh, uh, you need to, let's say, solve a lot of uh, linear programs. And those linear programs are pretty large, uh, especially because, uh, let's say, those plans you, you are trying to uh, investigate on, let's say, you would like to incorporate into your strategies, the number of plans is too large. So usually the papers uh, working in this, they are trying to, let's say, kind of simplify the strategy space of the defender. Uh, for instance, they assume that they have, let's say, a couple of guards and they are just sending one guard to a, to a single location and that's it, right? So they, they cannot just easily model different kinds of uh, possible executions of different kinds of uh, sequences of actions, uh, but rather they simplify this and once they, once they have this kind of, uh, let's say, Stuckelberg equilibrium on, on this, uh, let's say, simplified version of, of, of strategies, then they, using some sampling methods, they are trying to reconstruct the actual, uh, actual plans. Uh, but as far as I know, without any theoretical guarantees that this will be equilibrium, right? <clears throat> uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's the standard solution. Uh, we are, instead of that, we are proposing that it would be possible to model this uh, as cost adversarial, cost adversarial planning games. Uh, even though we are actually computing the Nash equilibrium, uh, still, uh, I think that it's, it's, it's somehow reasonable. I will, I will, let's say, compare those approaches uh, a bit later. But maybe uh, to make some example, because usually people working in, in, in those things, uh, they are using, using these uh, emotionally blackmailing pictures. So I, I'm doing the same as well. Uh, so you see that the, the, the pure uh, animals are dying uh, every day uh, in national parks. So, uh, so actually, this 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 is uh, I'd say one of the instances of, of these uh, of these security games. So assume that you have national park and you are trying to protect that. So you can uh, imagine that the national park is kind of a graph, right? Like where you have the different kinds of locations where a poacher can put a snare in order to catch an animal. And uh, you have some base, let's say, uh, in, in your national park, and you are just sending guards in order to uh, visit some locations and to find for the snares, right? Uh, of course, uh, different locations in your national park uh, have different attractivity, right? Based on the, on the let's say, density of the animals uh, in, in that location. So you can model that. that uh, by some expected costs. I mean, if, if, if a poacher puts some snare into some location, uh, then we can just say that, well, uh, uh, if, uh, if the animal is, is, is caught, then uh, the, the utility for the poacher is, I don't know, 10,000, whatever. Uh, and of course, we can just multiply by some, let's say, uh, probability that, that he will be success, success, successful with the, with the snare. Uh, uh, so for this particular example, let's say assume that all the locations are the same regarding the, let's say, uh, expected uh, successfulness of, 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 the, uh, of the poacher, uh, except of, uh, let's say, location six, which is, let's say, more attractive, right? So I have a 70% chance that I will, I will catch something in, in six, and, uh, and in the remaining locations, everything is just 30% chance. Right? I just did this, let's say, non-uniform example, because if it is uniform, then usually uh, the strategy is for the attacker is just to put snares to the, the, the let's say, the, the most distant locations and just to, I mean, it's, yeah, I'm also the idea. <clears throat> okay, so this is, let's say, a slightly non-symmetric version. So you can see the, the poacher's optimal strategy. Uh, still, uh, he wants to, let's say, place the snare to the most distant locations. But of course, uh, the six is very attractive. So, uh, and he, so he wants to use that. So, I mean, it, of course, I, <laughs> I cannot just explain it. This is just the outcome of the algorithm, right? Uh, <clears throat> but uh, apparently, it's good to, let's say, place the snares uh, quite often to five, even though it's quite close to, to the base, in order to uh, move the, the guard to, to the left part of the graph. Right, because uh, I forgot to say that, that the limited resources of the guard is that uh, he can, let's say, move only uh, 
uh, through the seven seven nodes, let's say, of the, of the graph, right? So, I mean, of course, if he would be able to, let's say, visit all the all the areas, then uh, the, the snare would be always uh, destroyed. Uh, so he can only just uh, let's say do the circular pass of length at most seven, right? I mean, uh, seven moves between the nodes. Uh, so if uh, if the poacher let's say puts the snare to the to, to the location five, everything is let's say moved towards uh, the left part of the graph. That's why uh, it's 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 good chance to let's say also put sometimes snare to to, to the interesting location six. So that's that's the the optimal strategy for the poacher, uh, and this is the optimal strategy for the guard. You can see that that uh, the six is visited uh, as as as. Uh, as many times as possible, but these, uh, let's say, with 0.25 uh, probability, uh, let's say this 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 patrol is, is uh, missing six, but the remaining uh, equilibrium uh, few strategies inside the, the equilibrium, uh, let's say, visit six. So that's 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 the outcome. So let me finally compare these two approaches. So existing approaches to let's say modeling security game, they uh, say model everything as Stackelberg K. Uh, that's good that you can let's say model it like a, with a matrix where you have uh, arbitrarily utilities for the let's say uh, defender and for the attacker. Uh, but the problem is that uh, it's usually not computationally feasible to compute actually the, the, the Stackelberg strategy. Uh, that's why they uh, kind of reduce the the strategy space for the defender. And then they just compute on, on this restricted version. They they uh, compute the Stackelberg strategy, and then they try to somehow reconstruct the actual plans without knowing that this is actually producing an equilibrium. Um, moreover, uh, they everything solve like a strong Stackelberg equilibrium. So uh, actually, if, if, if the if the poacher or if, if the attacker is not responding. Uh, uh, optimistically for the defender, then their their solutions might be even worse. Uh, on the other hand, he proposed to model such games as uh, cost adversarial playing games, which are almost zero sum. So I mean, it, what's nice on that that we can model the the pure strategies as really sequences of actions for the for the guards or for the defenders. Uh, we can compute uh, we can compute the Nash equilibrium of, of those games using uh, iterative methods like double oracle. So we don't have to just generate all the plans in order to compute the, 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 the equilibrium strategy. Uh, on the other hand, of course, uh, uh, the almost zero games, uh, of course, are restricted. You cannot just model the, the, the utility for the uh, attacker arbitrarily. On the other hand, uh, I would say that uh, if you compute the Nash equilibrium, uh, this basically means that you are preparing for the worst possible case. Right, uh, because and uh, this I think is quite reasonable in the sense that uh, I can imagine that uh, for the defender it's uh, relatively easy to let's say model his or her expenses uh, regarding the, the strategy, right? So I can just I know that I have some guys I need to pay them some uh, salaries. They are just driving some trucks along the some locations, so it costs some money. Uh, so I can model this, but on the other hand. Uh, I think it's pretty difficult to, to model uh, actual utility function for the attacker, right? So for for instance, I don't know uh, from, maybe you have to know a lot of about the attacker in order to, let's say, model this reasonably precisely. You have to know from, from which directions they are going to, to, let's say, put the snares into the national park. You have to know uh, what kind of logistic they have behind that. And even, let's say, for if they are using these for, let's say, uh, prevent protecting airports in LA against terrorists. Uh, I cannot imagine how to how to model utility for the terrorists, right? So uh, the terrorist might just be happy that that, <laughs> that uh, I don't know. He might be optimizing for the number of that that people, or maybe in number of uh, destroyed buildings. Uh, it's, it's difficult to let's say come with some uh, number saying, well, this is actually the utility of the terrorist. Uh, yeah, so. So that's basically all I wanted to say. So if you have some questions, uh, let's see the speaker. So 
thank you for a very inspiring talk. Uh, I wanted to ask, like you said, there are going to be many locations and it's like many guiding paths that, that you combine. Is, is there something that you could expect to be small in these instances? Some aspect of that, that makes it simpler. <laughs> Well, I mean, in these kind of games, usually they, they assume that the attacker is just, uh, let's say, placing uh, or attacking only single single location. Right? This is pretty small. Uh, on the other hand, I think that it's assumed that you are playing uh, simultaneously this game against several different people, right? So I mean, I'm just guarding uh, in, in my in my. I mean, of course, you could you could say, for example, if if I just looking for a snare and I, I know that there is exactly one, and I just find it and I can return home, right? Uh, but uh, in this sense, uh, in this case, it may make sense to really continue on on your path because uh, there might be different different poachers uh, also trying their luck. Uh, in the national park, right? So, well, but this may be not completely related to your, to, to your question. But. Yeah. Some more questions? Yes. If not, then let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>